Stanford University. What we're going to study tonight is angular momentum. What we're after is one of the most important, interesting, unintuitive, and yet very, very simple aspects of elementary particles, or anything else for that matter. Um, their spin, their, ang their spin angular momentum. Um, let's first talk a little bit about what angular momentum is. Well, let me, let me pretend for the moment that you knew what angular momentum was, which you probably do. But uh, you, get, you get a rough idea. It's got to do with how fast the system is rotating and how massive it is and uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Angular momentum is, first of all, a vector quantity. It points in a direction. The mathematical definition of the angular momentum is that its direction as a vector points along the axis of rotation. So that's kind of obvious. Um, there's a right-hand rule. If the system is rotating about an axis, you don't know offhand, without a definition, whether the angular momentum is pointing that way or that way. All I told you it was along the axis. So you need a rule. The rule is the right-hand rule. If it's rotating that way, you wrap your fingers around the direction of rotation, and your thumb points along the direction of the angular momentum. That's not something you prove. That's something you define, all right? the direction of angular momentum. It's built up out of the mass and the speed of rotation and that sort of thing, the moment of inertia to be exact, which is a combination of the mass and the size of the system, and the velocity, the angular velocity. And any system, of or any ordinary system, composite system, this uh, cup here, made up out of lots of atoms, it actually can have two kinds of angular momentum. One is called orbital angular momentum. And the orbital angular momentum is a consequence of the motion of its center of mass it could be angular momentum. Angular momentum, first of all, is relative to a particular axis. If an object is moving around an axis, it has angular momentum relative to that axis, even if the thing is not itself not spinning. That's a good word, spinning. Spinning means rotating about some internal axis. It has angular momentum by virtue of the fact that it's moving uh, let's say in a circular orbit around my head, I see it, it has angular momentum. That's not the angular momentum we're interested in, that orbital angular momentum. The angular momentum we're interested in is the angular momentum of spin. So what is the spin angular momentum? The spin angular momentum is whatever angular momentum would be there in a frame of reference where the system was at rest. So if the system is at rest, the only angle where the center of mass of the system is at rest. I don't mean that it's not rotating. I mean that its center of mass is standing still. In the frame of reference where its momentum is zero, ordinary momentum, any leftover angular momentum is called spin, basically. Uh, now, I wish I had a basketball or something that I could spin, but uh, just to illustrate. Ordinarily, in ordinary thinking about things, you can take a basketball and you can start it rotating. And you'll say, that's the same thing, that's the same object as the original basketball, which wasn't rotating, except it's now rotating. Okay. If we also keep track of the fact that in quantum mechanics, the amount of angular momentum is discrete, you can't interpolate continuously between different angular momenta, then you could ask the question, it becomes a def question of definition. If you start an object with a little bit, with no angular momentum, and then you ro rotate it up, you spin it up, and give it some angular momentum, is it the same object rotating, or is it a new object? Now, that's obviously a matter of definition. But in practice, the real issue is how much energy 
does it take to set it into rotation? Now, you say, I can set it into the smallest amount of rotation, arbitrarily small amount of rotation, and so it takes arbitrarily small amount of energy to start it rotating. But that's true in classical mechanics. You have a continuous interpolation between the thing not rotating and the thing rotating. But in quantum mechanics, you don't have a continuous interpolation. And so I would say it's a matter of definition whether you want to think of a rotating nucleus as the same object or a discreetly different object. But the real question, as I said, is how much energy does it take to start a system in rotation? Given that the rotational states are discrete, it makes sense how much to ask how much energy does it take to set it into the first excited state, the first lowest amount of rotation that you can get. If it's very small, it only takes a little bit of energy, then the object is probably pretty recognizable as the same object as when it was rest. But if it takes an enormous amount of energy, well, it could take so much, amount, so much energy that it would just blow the system apart. So for example, uh, an atom, if uh, you try to set an atom into rotation with too much uh, angular momentum, the electrons will just fly off and that atom won't even be there. So you certainly make things which are distinguishably different when you set them into rotation and, and discreetly different. What about an electron? Can you set an electron, forget for the moment that the electron has intrinsic spin for a minute, let's forget that for a minute. Can you set an electron into rotation so that it resembles the same object except rotating about some axis? Or is the electron somehow so small and so point-like that it doesn't make any sense to set it into rotation? A thing which is infinitely small, a simple point, a simple mathematical point, it's hard to conceive of, at least with our usual mental pictures, of setting that thing into rotation. But we don't know that the electron is infinitely small. Maybe the electron is not infinitely small. Uh, if it's not infinitely small, maybe we have a chance of seeing a rotating electron. Okay. So the question becomes, how much energy does it take to set an electron into rotation? Now, uh, the answer tends to depend on the size of an object. For a given mass, it depends on the size of an object. Surprisingly, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not surprising, the smaller the object, the more energy it takes to set it into rotation. Big objects, you can set into very, very small uh, angular velocities. Small objects take larger amounts of energy to excite them, to a given amount of rotation, to a given amount of angular momentum. The electron may be so small, and it probably is known to be so small, that the energy that it would take to give it one more unit of angular momentum would be astronomical, would be uh, maybe the Planck energy or some humongously large energy. And so we don't see in the laboratory rotating electrons. In fact, the rotating electron may be so different from an ordinary electron that we wouldn't even call it an electron anymore. Uh, the upshot of this is that when we talk about objects in quantum mechanics, we are, or particles in particular, or nuclei, or any simple systems, relatively simple systems, they have a amount of angular momentum which characterizes them and which once and for all is fixed. You don't talk about electrons with different, angular, it's different spin angular momentum. The angular momentum of the electron is always the same if it has any angular momentum at all. Okay, you say, why is that? Well, just because if it had more angular momentum, you'd call it a different object. Right. Now, angular momentum, as I said, is a vector. We're going to define exactly what uh, I have to define it in a moment. But it's a vector. It has a length. 
The length of the vector is proportional to the speed of rotation and so forth. It can point in any direction, or at least classically it can point in any direction. Shall we think of pointing the angular momentum of an object in different directions as corresponding to different objects? Let's suppose we now do have an object which has some angular momentum. We call it, what shall we call it? I don't want to call it an electron. It, it, it's a, um, a, a what? A spintron. Yeah, a spintron, spintron. Okay, a spintron. It's a spintron. We identify it as a spintron, and its angular momentum is pointing that way. Can the angular momentum point in another direction? Well, yes, it better be able to because the laws of physics are rotationally invariant. There's nothing special about one axis than another axis. So yes, the same object can be made to rotate in a different direction, even if it can't be made to rotate with more total angular momentum. So pointing it in different directions, we would say, corresponds to the same object. If an electron does have angular momentum, we should be able to think of that angular momentum in any direction. On the other hand, the amount of angular momentum, the magnitude of it, is quantized. And so, as I said, uh, the gap to the first excited state of the electron may be so large that we wouldn't even call it an electron. OK, so the angular momentum can point in any direction. It is quantized. And now we have to enter into the theory of angular momentum. Tonight, what we're going to do is the mathematics of angular momentum. And it's very magical. It's magical, and it seems totally abstract, um, totally unintuitive. And then, pomp, out comes experimental uh, facts and predictions and uh, the entire properties of spin as an experimental um, you know, uh, observational fact about particles. All right, let's, yeah, question? Can touch on why energy required to spin a small particle? Uh, OK, do you, know what, do you know what the moment of inertia of an object is? OK, uh, let me answer the question. Uh, the simplest, uh, it is counterintuitive a little bit. Uh, well, it is and it isn't. Um, the moment of inertia is a combination of the, um, the mass of the object and the radius of the object. We take a ball of some sort, right? It's mr squared. Now, it depends on the detailed shape of the object, and it depends on how the matter is distributed. Sometimes it's three, thir uh, three halves mr squared, you know, but it's a border mr squared. And it's called the moment of inertia, I. Okay. The energy of a rotating object, I refer, that's one thing. Now, then there is the angular momentum. The angular momentum of the object is made up, if the object, let's say, uh, the outer boundary of the object, let's say, is moving with velocity v, right? then, roughly speaking, order of magnitude, the mass times the velocity, that's the ordinary momentum of a, of a piece of it, mass times velocity. And if you multiply that by r, that's, uh, that's the angular momentum. Momentum times distance is angular momentum. So the momentum of a, of a little piece of it times the distance from the center of it is the angular momentum. And if you write down the kinetic energy, the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. What you'll discover is that it's the angular momentum squared divided by the moment of inertia, twice the moment of inertia to be exact. So that's the energy, the kinetic energy of rotation is the angular momentum squared divided by twice the moment of inertia. Now, for a given mass, let's say the mass of the electron, the smaller it is, the smaller the moment of inertia. But the moment of inertia goes in the denominator. And that means the amount of energy that it takes to increase the angular momentum by one unit is inversely proportional to the square of the size of the object. OK, so it's a classical mechanical fact 
The only thing that comes new in uh, quantum mechanics is that the angular momenta is discrete, are discrete. Okay. But the fact that for a given angular momentum, a smaller object costs more energy, that's a classical mechanical fact. OK, let's, uh, let's do some of the mathematics. And tonight, we're really going to do the mathematics of angular momentum. It's both totally unintuitive and simple. All right? Simple enough, uh, and this is a great example of where you see extremely abstract mathematics, which you can follow, suddenly popping out uh, uh, very unintuitive answers, but nevertheless experimental answers. All right, let's, uh, let's begin. Well, first of all, let's begin with a single particle orbiting a center. Circular orbit for simplicity. The angular momentum is the momentum of the particle times the distance from the origin. Mass times velocity times distance, but we'll just call it momentum. That's the angular momentum in this very simple context. Uh, is it positive or is it negative? That depends on the sense of rotation. Going this way, I think I call positive. Going that way, I'll call negative, but uh, that, it's, it's not very important. That's the angular momentum uh, of a point object. Now, this object has momentum, has angular momentum because it has momentum, and it has momentum because it has velocity. So this is not yet spin. But now, supposing we had two particles at opposite ends of the diameter here, both going with the same sense of rotation. Now the center of mass would be at rest. The center of mass of the system would be at rest, but the angular momentum would certainly not be zero. It would be the sum of the two angular momenta, and they're going in the same direction. So here's an example where the center of mass of the system can be at rest, but there's still angular momentum. This is spin. Okay. All right, now let's uh, get a little more refined in our precise definition of angular momentum. I said before, angular momentum is a vector. And that means, or that's denoted by putting a little arrow over the top of it. Momentum is a vector. And also spatial location is the spatial location of an object. It is relative to an origin, relative to an origin. We can call it a vector. It's the radial vector. Let's talk about the components first, before we get on to what angular momentum is. The components of the R vector are just the coordinates of the position of the particle. So the components of R, this R over here, let's write it over here. The components of R are just x, y, and z. x, y, and z being the coordinates of the position of the particle. And I'm also going to sometimes call them x1, x2, and x3. x3 being z, x2 being y, x1 being x. OK, so we have these two vectors. And somehow the angular momentum is a product of the two vectors. The angular momentum is itself a vector. How do you make a vector out of two vectors by, multipl by multiplication. What kind of rule of multiplication is there that takes two vectors and um, combines them together by some rule of multiplication to make a new vector? And it's only, that's right, there's only one rule. There's only one such rule, uh, and that's the cross product. The cross product, R, and in fact, there's an ambiguity. Is it R cross P or P cross R? That's a question of whether you're right-handed or left-handed. Do you use the right-hand rule or the left-hand rule? Uh, the standard convention is that it's R cross P. Is that by your left-handed? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, I think it's right-handed. Maybe it's left-handed. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Uh, we, we could figure it out, but I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, it's R cross P. Oh, we labeled the coordinates of the r vector, there's also the p vector. The p vector also has coordinates. And its coordinates are px, py, and pz. 
or P1, P2, P3. Okay, those, uh, those, that's the notation we'll use. Now I can ask, what are the components of the angular momentum? So for that, all you have to know is how to build a cross product, and I'll assume everybody knows how to build a cross product, so let's just do it. Here's the rule. The x component of the cross product, the x component of the angular momentum, is the y component of position times the z component of momentum minus the z component of position times the y component of momentum. This is the only one that I ever remember. Lx equals y times pz. All right, I read that off. The other one here, I know that I have to put them in the opposite. I have to change pz to z, py to y. And then I want to go down from there, lx, ly, and lz. I never remember them, but I know the rule. The rule is you just cycle from x to y to z and back to x to y to z. Think of x, y, and z as being a points on a clock, and you go from one to the next. So when you go from x to y, y goes to z, z goes to x. Let's go down to the next one, y, z, x. This is not, I'm not finished with the formula. z, x, y, p, y, minus x, p, z, minus uh, y, p, x. The only reason I emphasize the cycling is to keep track of the sign. How do I know that ly isn't uh, x, p, z, minus z, p, x? OK, that's the rule. You cycle through that way. And um, right. That's the component of angular momentum of a point particle moving in the vicinity of some origin of coordinates. Right? It's the orbital angular momentum of that particle. It's not the spin angular momentum. To make a spin angular momentum for a system of ordinary, in classical mechanics, to make a spin angular momentum, you've got to have a lot of particles, at least two anyway. I showed you how to make a spin angular momentum with two of them. You have to have several particles, two being a uh, several. All right, how do you build the angular momentum of a composite system? You just add the angular momenta as vectors. You add them as vectors. You add the angular momentum of all the constituents. Once you add the angular momentum, then you can have a spin where the total momentum is equal to 0, but the angular momentum is not equal to 0. But this is the basic formula for a single indivisible point particle. So, and as I said, you just add them up for, uh, for a lot of particles. Next step, we want to do the quantum mechanics of angular momentum. This is the classical mechanics. Actually, it's also the quantum mechanics. But to get to the quantum mechanics, the basic mathematics of quantum mechanics is the quantum mechanics of operators. All quantities of physical significance, meaning to say things that you can observe, measure, all those things are represented in quantum mechanics by what? Operators, yeah, emission operators, operators. And there's no special exception about angular momenta. The components of angular momenta are, ma are represented by operators. But to figure out what those operators are, all we really need to know is what the operators which represent uh, uh, position and momentum are. In fact, we don't even really have to know very much about the detailed property of the position and uh, momentum operators. All we have to know is their commutation relations. With their commutation relations, that's all we need to know in order to carry on and work out everything. OK, so what, what does it mean, or what are the implications of two operators commuting? Let's suppose I have two operators which represent two observable quantities the A-ness and the B-ness of a system, and I know that A and B commute. What does that tell me about uh, observation? Simultaneous. 
Yeah, exactly. You can simultaneously measure them. What if they don't commute? Mm -mm, then you can't simultaneously measure them. The most famous example of two things that you cannot simultaneously measure, of course, is position and momentum. The implication is that in quantum mechanics, the operators representing, where did I erase them? P1, P2, and P3, on the one hand, x1, x2, and x3, don't commute among themselves. Okay. So what are the right commutation relations? All right, now, to some extent, these are postulates of quantum mechanics. You find them in the first chapter of Dirac's book, and they're basically uh, postulates, if you like. Uh, but uh, there, there are limitations on what you can write down, but we're going to take them as postulates. All right, the first postulate is that you can simultaneously measure all three coordinates of position. There's no limitation on how well you can determine the x, y, and z coordinates of position. They're all simultaneously measurable. And the implication of that is that every x commutes with every, every other x. We can write that down, xi, xj equals 0 for all i and j, for all i and j. Incidentally, anything commutes with itself. It would be very weird if something didn't commute with itself. That would say you could measure it, but you couldn't measure it simultaneously with itself. Bad idea. OK, so everything commutes with itself. Same thing for momenta. There is no limitation on being able to simultaneously measure the different components of momentum. So pi pj equals 0. What about x's with p's? Well, that's exactly what the uncertainty principle is about. It tells us that we cannot simultaneously measure coordinates and position. But which coordinates and which positions can, which components can we not measure simultaneously? And the answer, th th there's not a lot of freedom about this, but uh, nevertheless, I'm going to just state it as a postulate, that x1 and p2 can be simultaneously measured. The x coordinate of a particle and the y component of mo its momentum are not limited by the uncertainty principle. It's the x component of position and the x component of momentum which are not simultaneously measurable. So we have that x with px is not equal to 0. Anybody remember what it is equal to? Ih bar. It's small. Why? Because uh, we certainly don't expect uh, macroscopic big heavy objects to, uh, to behave uh, with such bizarre behaviors. So it's small, one unit of angular momentum. Uh, sorry, one unit of uh, Planck's constant. Uh, and so forth for y and z. And so we can write down a general formula that the commutator of xi with pj is i h bar if i equals j, and it's 0 if i doesn't equal j. Is that clear? OK. So to represent that, we put the Kronecker delta here. And that's a nice uh, systematic way to describe the properties of position and momentum. That turns out all, to be all we really need to know uh, in, order to, in order to understand the properties of angular momentum, and in order to understand the properties of spin. Let's see, there's one other point uh, that is worth emphasizing, and that's that angular momentum has units of Planck's constant. How do I know that? Well, angular momentum has units of distance times momentum. Uh, here's distance times momentum. On the right-hand side is Planck's constant. It also occurs, of course, in the uncertainty principle. Delta x delta p is greater than or equal to whatever. Uh, some number times Planck's constant. So you see that Planck's constant has units of length times momentum, and angular momentum has units of length times momentum. So it's not completely surprising that angular momentum is quantized in units of Planck's constant, uh, in units of the basic quantum in nature, which is Planck's constant. 
Okay, but uh, we, we haven't gotten there yet. I just pointed that out. What I want to work out for you is the commutation relations of the components of angular momentum. We're going to find out that once we work out the commutation relations of the angular momentum, components of the angular momentum, we can forget this. We won't need it anymore. It's just the components of the angular momentum whose commutation relations we want. All right, so let's do it over here. Let's first compute the commutator of LX with LY. Okay. It's not very hard. Uh, I will have to wing it a little bit because uh, I haven't, uh, I would have to remind you what all the rules about the algebraic rules of commutators are. But it's pretty simple. It's simple enough that, uh, <coughs> that you can see what happens. All right, so we want the commutator of LX with LY. LX with LY is YPZ is the commutator of YPZ minus ZPY. That's the first uh, entry into the commutator. And we're going to commute that with, that was, uh, that was LX, with LY, which is ZPX minus XPZ. I think in the last 24 hours, I've done this three times on the blackboard. <laughs> the, first, uh, the first two times were last night when the 30 people who failed the course showed up late. <laughs> Cycling from top to bottom. Yeah. But you can actually just cycle from left to right and forget about the other two equations. So y starts with z. Z starts with x. All right. However you like. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Okay, let's see if we can figure this out. Let's see, y, p, z. Let's look at the commutator of this term of the first factor with this term of the second factor. There's nothing to prevent y. You know, when you think about commutators, you're thinking about pushing operators through each other. Can they freely pass through each other without a change in the, uh, in the value of the operator? All right. Now, y commutes with x, so it can go right past x. It also compute, uh, commutes with pz. Pz commutes with x, and Pz commutes with Pz. So you can push this one right through this one, no obstruction. So these two commute with each other, contribute nothing to the commutator. I think there's another combination, let's see, is it this one, Z, yeah, these two, all, yeah, these two also commute with each other. The two which don't commute with each other are the two pairs, this and this and this with this. So let's see if we can work it out. Um, we have y, p, z, z, p, x. The only thing which doesn't commute here is p, z with z. All right. So I maintain that the answer is just y times, I don't want to use red, is just y times p, x, and it doesn't matter which order you write them down, y times px, and then there's the commutator of pz with z. What's the commutator of pz with z? Minus ih bar. Why is it minus ih bar? Because commutators in the opposite order change sign. Commutator is anti-symmetric, meaning when you change the order of what you write in the bracket, it changes sign. A, B minus B, A, if you, if you interchange it with B, it would just change sign. All right, so this, this commutator of P, Z with Z is minus I, H bar. All right, then we have this guy over here with this one over here. What is it that doesn't commute here? P, Y, and X commute. So it's a plus, minus times minus is plus, uh, P, Y times X, but then we have the commutator of z with pz, and that's i h bar. So i h bar, another i h bar, or in other words, the whole thing is, oh, that's, sorry, uh, what did I write here? Piece of y. Going this one. 
um, piece of y, right? Yep. X piece x piece of y. And again, in each of these expressions here, it doesn't matter which way you order the two uh, constituent operators here. Okay, the whole thing then is i h bar x p y minus y p x. A bunch of mumbo jumbo, but uh, nevertheless, it's very effective. X p y minus y p x is L z. So, we've learned that the commutator of Lx with Ly is just, sorry, ih bar. ih bar Lz. <coughs> That's kind of pretty. That when you commute the two components of the angular momentum, you get back another component of angular momentum. You don't have to remember anything about p's and x's anymore. The commutation relations of angular momenta are closed among themselves, and the algebra, this is, you call this the algebra of angular momentum, is something abstract which doesn't even really remember where it came from, meaning to say that it doesn't contain the p's and x's. Of it. <coughs> That's Lx with Ly. Okay. Then, either cycling vertically or horizontally, doesn't matter, you can write down the next one, Ly with Lz, that's I h bar Lx, and what's the next one, X, Y, Z, Y, Z, X, is I h bar Lz, L, L, Y. Okay, those are the, those are the fundamental um, relationships on which the theory of angular momentum is built. Now, the next fact which I will tell you is that if you have many particles and you add up the angular momenta and then commute them, you find exactly the same relationship. It doesn't matter that this was a single particle, it could be many particles, and it could be many particles in their own rest frame, in the rest frame of the uh, center of mass. So this will also be the commutation relations for the components of spin angular momentum. Right, so these, as I said, are our starting point. Uh, you might ask, is there anything special about the choice of axes? I chose the x, the y, and the z axis, but I never told you what x and y and z were. They could be the, uh, uh, the edges of the room, or they could be, as you wanted, to use a diagonal uh, direction, and two other funny diagonal directions. As long as they're mutually perpendicular, they form a perfectly good Cartesian coordinate system. Given the components of a vector in one frame of reference, you can commute, compute them in any other frame of reference. So, in principle, we could work out from this the commutation relations of the components of angular momentum in some other set of axes. What we would find is that they have exactly the same form. They would have exactly the same form if I chose primed axes. Axes which are different, I would just put some primes in here. In other words, the commutation relations of angular momentum are rotationally invariant. They take the same form in every frame of reference. And that guarantees that whatever theory we're making of angular momentum, it'll, it will be independent, the, the observable facts will be independent of what axes we choose to, uh, to do the mathematics here. Is, Far, it, is it independent of translation as well? It is, but uh, it is, it is, but uh, the spin, the spin angular momentum. The, the, yeah, the spin angular momentum is. Um, but certainly, this much is quite independent of direction. Yeah. Right. But it's also, yes, it is also independent of uh, translation. Okay, next step. Now we're going to be now we're going to be doing uh, abstract algebra. Okay, magic. Uh, like what we did so far. Well, <laughs> uh, so far, so far, uh, we didn't get anything out of it. It only becomes magic when you get something. All right? You can, you know, you can write down an infinite number of formulas. You can get a computer. You can plug in these rules into a computer. 
and then have it grind out all possible theorems. Uh, uh, ape can do that. Right? And mostly they'll grind out uninteresting theorems. It becomes magic when all of a sudden you look back and you say, wow, that's an experimental fact that I can um, confirm. Or that's telling me something interesting about the physics of uh, the operational um, process of measurement. So we'll get there. But we're still just doing abstract mathematics for the moment. But of course, I know where I'm going. You don't know where I'm going, so you just have to follow. But after you see it, you'll know, and then you can do it yourself. Okay, so... Uh, some of you know. What if the, uh, what if the X, Y, and Z axes that you choose are spinning along with the particles? No, that's a, that we don't want to do. That we don't want to do. We want to use inertial reference frames. And spinning reference frames are not inertial. Nevertheless, I will tell you, it's still true, but, uh, but uh, we don't want to get into that at the moment. Certainly the angular momentum is not invariant undergoing to rotating frames of reference. If we had a system which is spinning and it had some spin, and we went to a rotating frame of reference which spun with it, then it wouldn't look like it had any angular momentum. So it's clear that, uh, that we don't want to go to rotating frames of reference, or at least the angular momentum won't be invariant. All right, so inertial frames of reference. Reference frames which uh, have no centrifugal forces, and no Coriolis forces, and so forth. All right, now we're going to invent two new operators, which are very simply related to these, as simple as possible. They're called L plus and minus. There are two of them. Let's write it down, L plus and L minus. L plus is equal to Lx plus I Ly. And L minus is equal to Lx minus I Ly. Now I'll tell you right now what these are. These are raising and lowering operators analogous to the harmonic oscillator creation and annihilation operators. They take an angular momentum along a given axis, namely the z-axis, and they bump you up a step and they bump you down a step. But well, we're going to show that. We're going to show that. Another definition is that the measurable values of LZ, we're going to be concentrating on LZ. Now, there's nothing special about the z-axis, but on the other hand, there's nothing to forbid me from focusing on the z-axis. Nothing special about it. Nevertheless, I wish to choose an axis uh, to, uh, to work with. I'm going to choose the z-axis. And I'm going to call the eigenvalues of LZ, the measurable values that it can take on, I'm going to call them M times h-bar. h-bar is just a number. If we set h-bar equal to 1, which I think I will do now because I will never, on the blackboard, in real time be able to keep track of all the h-bars. Later on we can put them back. LZ is just called M. That's a historical notation. M, as I said, is the angular momentum in units of h-bar. Okay, so it's just, uh, but, um, and it'll turn out to be a quantized variable. Okay, it's called M for some historical reasons that I don't know. And uh, that's the notation we'll use. What I want to calculate, I'm not interested for our purposes in the commutator between Lx, uh, L plus and L minus. I'll tell you if you want to work it out. It's proportional to Lz. But don't, that's not our interest right now. I want to work out the commutator of L plus with Lz. You'll see why as we go along. Right, so we want L plus with LZ, also L minus with LZ, but let's do L plus with LZ. So this is equal to commutator of LX plus ILY with LZ. Well, we have all the rules. This is easy. Oh my God, what did I do with them? Here they are. All right. Commutator of LX with LZ. Can somebody read it off for me? Minus LY, ILY. Minus I L Y. We're setting H bar equal to 1 for the moment, right? So L X with L Z, do I believe you? Mm -hmm. 
I do. Minus I L Y. And what about uh, what about L Y with L Z? So then there's plus I, and now L Y with L Z. Somebody read it off. I L X. I L X. So that's I squared L X, and I squared is just minus one. <laughs> And this is just equal to minus L plus. Right? It's minus Lx plus Ily. Okay, so we have our first commutation relation. I think I can get rid of this. It's just minus L plus. What about L minus with LZ? I won't drag you through it. I'll just write down the answer. I think the answer is plus L minus. When you compute, when you commute L plus with LZ, you get back L plus. When you compute, when you commute L minus with LZ, you get back L minus with a sign that, uh, that depends on whether it's L plus or L minus. These are the basic commutation relations that we're going to use. Okay, the next step is I want to show that L plus and L minus are bumping operators which bump you up and down, like raising or like creation and annihilation operators for harmonic oscillators. Now, when L plus and L minus act, they change the Z component of angular momentum. We're going to focus. Remember, we can only measure one component of the angular momentum at a time. Oh, I didn't say that, did I? No, we didn't say that. We should say it right now. How many of the components of angular momentum can we simultaneously measure? The answer is one. Any two of them don't commute. Any two of them don't commute. And so at most, we can measure one component of angular momentum at a time. We pick one direction, we call it the quantization axis, but there's nothing special about it, and we focus on it. And uh, we are interested now in the possible values that LZ can take on. In other words, what is the possible values of M? And what we're going to do now is we're going to show that L plus bumps you up in M, increases the eigenvalue M by one unit. So let's see if we can do that. Let's suppose we have a state, let's call it M, such that LZ acting on M is equal to what? M times M. M on M. In other words, that little M is an eigenvalue of LZ with eigenvector, ket vector M. That's what it means to say that M is an eigenvalue. <coughs> We know what that means. We've been through this a number of times. Okay, what we want to prove is that if you act with L plus on M, that's a new vector. Let's put a red box around it. It's a new, it's a new ket vector. What I want to prove is that that's a ket vector with eigenvalue m plus 1, with eigenvalue of LZ equal to m plus 1. So let's do it. All we have to do is multiply this by LZ and see what we get. What should we get if it really is an eigenvector? We should get m plus 1 times the same thing in the red box. We should get, I won't bother writing it down, but uh, we should get m plus 1 times the thing in the red box. All right. Now, this would be easy to compute if L plus, if LZ commuted with L plus. Then we would just push the LZ through and use the fact that LZ on M just gives us M times M. Okay? That would be easy. But it's not that easy. We can't push LZ through L plus. Why? Because they don't commute. 
But if we use the commutation relations, we can. So let's write out what this commutation relation means. It means L plus LZ minus LZ L plus equals minus L plus. I've just written it out by hand in excruciating detail. The thing that I'm interested in here, the thing that came up here, was LZ times L plus. So let's put that on one side of the equation and write that this is L plus LZ plus L plus, oops, not LZ, but L plus, <coughs> equals LZ L plus. That's what I want, LZ L plus, with LZ on the left, L plus on the right. Okay? And here I have it on the left side of the equation. We'll see, is it useful? We're going to find out if it is useful. So, this is equal then to L plus LZ acting on M plus L plus acting on M. I'll stop here if there are any questions. I think I've been clear, but if not, I'll... Okay, but now it's easy. What is LZ when it acts on M? Just replaces the LZ by an M, right? So let's take an M out, put the M over here, take out this LZ, close it up a little bit, M times L plus. And here we just have L plus times M. What are we going to do with that? I don't know what we're going to do with it, but we just, uh, put, what we're going to do with it is put a red box around it. L plus times M. L plus times M. Same red box, same thing in the red box on each side. So what's in the red box has the property that when LZ hits it, it multiplies it by M plus 1. The thing in the red box is an eigenvector of LZ with eigenvalue M plus 1. That's a little bit of magic, and what it tells us is that if we have a state with a given value of LZ, there must be another state with one additional unit of LZ. In other words, you can bump up LZ by one unit. Um, you can bump down LZ the same way, except using the lowering operator. So you can check that, that L minus on M gives you an eigenvector with eigenvalue M minus 1. Right, so now let's think about, now we've learned something rather non-trivial. We've discovered that the spectrum of angular momentum, of Z component of angular momentum, is spaced by integers. Here's the spectrum of angular momentum. And whatever it is, it's spaced by integers. I don't know, it could be, uh, uh, I don't know what the spectrum of angular momentum is yet, the spectrum of possible values of it. It could be pi, pi plus 1, pi plus 2, pi plus 3, pi minus 1, pi minus 2, or it could be the square root of 2, the square root of 2 plus 1, the square root of 2 plus 2. Whatever they are, they're gapped by integers. But we still don't know what the uh, what any one of them is. No. I know it's only. Yeah, we'll we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Okay. Now, next question. Can it go on and on forever? Now, remember, we're talking about a particular particle. We're talking about a particle of something. We're not talking about um, the whole world. We're just talking about some particular elementary particle. Let's say a neutron or, or even a nucleus. How much can we bump up the angular momentum, the Z component of angular momentum, before it's not the same object anymore? Before we simply run out of 
possibilities. So we're talking about an object. Let's think classically for a minute. It's rotating about some axis, and we're not allowed to increase the rate of rotation. That would give us a new object, a different object. Uh, but we are allowed to rotate the angular momentum. We're allowed to rotate the angular momentum, but we're not allowed to increase its, uh, its amount without changing the whole nature of the object. <coughs> okay. So there's another, another way of saying it is that there's a given length or a given value of L squared. The magnitude of L is fixed. The magnitude of L is fixed, and it characterizes the particle. Just as a particle is characterized by mass, it's also characterized by a length of the angular momentum vector, or better yet, the square of the length of the angular momentum vector. <coughs> Okay, how do we maximize the z component of angular momentum? We simply point it, uh, we simply point the object upward. We point the spin axis upward. And that's going to be the maximum angular momentum, the maximal z component of the angular momentum. So from an intuitive point of view, there ought to be a maximum value for the angular momentum of a specific particle, a top to this. And after that, nothing. Well, how can that be? How can that be? We've already proved that by acting with L plus, we bump up the angular momentum. How can there possibly be a ceiling to the, uh, to the rule? The answer is exactly the same as the harmonic oscillator creation and annihilation <laughs> operators. Remember what happens to the annihilation operator if you hit the bottom state, the state of lowest energy. It just gives you zero. Okay, That's the one possibility we left out here, that perhaps there are states, or a state, where L plus will give zero. That would have to be the case if there was a maximum angular momentum. So for the maximum angular momentum, if there is such a thing, and there is for every given object, L plus on, let's call it M max, must equal zero. So there's a cutoff. You can't go past a certain point. What about the minimum value of the angular momentum? Minimum means the one deepest down uh, in the cellar. It had better just be the negative of this. Why must it be the negative? Why couldn't it be something else? That's just rotational invariance. If you can build a system with an angular momentum along a given axis of a certain value, you must be able, by, by rotational invariance, by every axis being equivalent to every other axis, you must be able to rotate that angular momentum and have exactly the same value except pointing in the opposite direction. So the bottom must be, let's call this a max. And m min must be equal to minus m max equals m min. M min, of course, being negative. And from m max and m min, we can bump up an integer or bump down an integer. And then that, that now fixes for us some properties of the spectrum. Um, it's got to be symmetrically located relative to zero. And it's got to be gapped or spaced by integers. There's only two possibilities. If you think about it for a few minutes, there's only two possibilities. Well, there's many possibilities, but they come in two families. The first, in the first family, zero is a possible value of m. This is m equals zero. And then m equals one, m equals minus one, and so forth, until you get to m max and until you get the m-min, m-max, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, m-max, minus m-max. How many such states are there altogether? Two, two m-max plus, plus, plus one. <coughs> yeah, two m-max plus one. 
m max here, m max here, and then one more at the origin. Twice m max plus one. That's the number of possible states. Of course, I haven't told you what m max is. But that's because m max could be anything depending on the specific particle or the specific object we're talking about. So specific particles have their own value of m max. And that m max is called the spin of the particle. For example, there are particles that have no spin at all. Then the spectrum of angular momentum is just m equals zero and nothing else. When you hit it with a raising operator, you get zero. When you hit it with a lowering operator, you get zero. That's spin zero. Then there's the possibility of spin one. Spin one is a situation where m equals one <coughs> is the ceiling, and m equals minus one is the floor. Can't go below the floor, can't go above the ceiling. That's spin one, it's called the spin one particle. You can have spin two particles, you can have spin three particles, and so forth. Uh, an example, the Higgs boson is a spin zero particle. The photon is a spin one particle, and the Z boson is a spin one particle. Are there spin two particles in nature? Well, the graviton is a spin two particle. How about spin three particles? No object that is ordinarily called an elementary particle is spin three, but there are certainly objects with spin three. There are nuclei with spin three. Uh, there are basketballs with spin three. Uh, there are galaxies with spin three. Rather hard to find them. But uh, yeah, there are lots of objects with spin three. But among the elementary particles in nature, the things that we ordinarily call the elementary particles, spin zero, spin one, and spin two. Spin two is in. Uh, now that's not completely clear because I missed a, po a possibility. And the possibility was that n equals zero was not in the spectrum. The only other situation which is symmetrical about the vertical and which is gapped by integers, spaced by integers, let's put zero over here, is to start at n equals a half and n equals minus a half and then go upward in units of one. So this one would be three halves, this one would be minus three halves, and so forth, until you come to n max. In this case, all the, all the eigenvalues would be half integers. The simplest example being just the half spin particle. Again, you call you use the you um, describe the particle as having a spin equal to the maximum value. Okay? So, an object which only had spin a half or a z component equal to a half and minus a half, that's the simplest object with the half spin kind of spectrum. That's called a half spin particle. <coughs> the next one would be called spin three halves particle and spin five halves particle. And particles come in these two types. Integer spin and half integer spin. Is there a question? No. Half, half integer spin and integer spin. Yeah? Is there a maximum half spin for part like the risk for pulse? Yeah, yeah. But the only thing is that the, that the maximum is going to be a half integer. It's going to be not an integer. A spin three halves particle, a maximum would be three halves. A spin five halves particle, a spin maximum would be five halves. When you talk about elementary particles, you say this is not, is not a spin three or higher. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Uh, in all uh, speculations about elementary particles, basically the combination of Lorentz invariance, quantum mechanics, and a few things, other things, tell you that there are no particles, elementary particles, that spin higher than two. That will allow zero, one, and two, and it will allow a half and three halves. So all the standard particles of elementary particle physics are zero, a half, one, three halves, and two. But you can build composite objects, yeah. The, your line there allows for negative spin values. 
Well, uh, negative spin value just means just just means uh, rotated uh, around the axis, so it's pointing down. And we characterize the particle by the maximum value of the spin, meaning the maximum positive value. So let me go kind of way off topic here. So okay. why why are there only say two orientations? Who said there were two? Okay. There's been one, zero particle or none. Okay, two or there's been three particle. There are three. I know what you're asking. You're asking what happens to the directions in between. You're asking, yeah. Huh? yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about that. That's where quantum. That's quantum mechanics in your face. Okay. So that, uh, that's, uh, let me add one to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. That's not off topic at all. Okay, and let me ask one more. Let me add to that when you get to that topic, which is what about like a corkscrew waves? A corkscrew. A corkscrew motion is a motion which is moving and rotating. An electromagnetic wave can be a corkscrew wave, yeah. Meaning uh, circular polarization. Circularly polarized waves. Yes. Yeah. Currently, all our waves, all our math, very classical waveforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nevertheless, a circularly polarized photon is one with a spin angular momentum along the axis going in exactly the direction that you think. Right? A circularly polarized wave is composed of circularly polarized photons, and a circularly polarized photon means one whose angular momentum along that axis is pointing along that axis. But to talk about, to talk about objects at rest, which is what we're talking about now, it doesn't make sense to talk about corkscrew motion because corkscrew really has to do with a simultaneous rotation and motion along an axis. So at the moment, the object you're hunting for, the mathematical term, is helicity. Helicity has got to do with the um, orientation of the spin relative to the direction of motion. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come to that. Very, very important is concept. Is there an elementary particle that we know of that has three halves spin? Uh, depends on whether... What, define the term no. <laughs> no electron that we measured, or that we have hundreds of hunches, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's a matter of <coughs> speculation. Speculation is too uh, too um, wrong word. Conjecture. It's a matter of conjecture that there exists a supersymmetric part partner of the graviton, which is called the gravitino, which has spin three halves. That has not and will never be experimentally detected. If you use L squared. I have a question. Directly detected. Directly. At this point, the L's are no longer acting like the, their original definition, because if you just plug their or uh, their original definition in, you wouldn't get these limits. So well, there, is there a must be a difference. Well, mm -hmm. it looks like there's no longer acting on the original space of uh, psi functions that we had. Somehow there's a new psi functions. Um, the, new, the, the original space of cats. No, because we, we didn't know what the original space of Ketz was. We didn't know what the original okay, space was. Okay, well, if you this, say... What we're deducing is the properties of that space. Okay. That's what we're doing. We didn't know what the original it, space was. It's not the yeah. space that yeah. you usually take in right. elementary quantum Ketz. No. Okay. No, this is something new. So This I is spin you're, space. You're going to tell us what the space is? Oh, it is the space of these integers. That's it. For a particle of spin m, the space is the, the, the basis vectors. Are. You, you specify what a state is by saying what its basis vectors are. Its basis vectors are simply labeled with the values of m along this axis. That's it. That's, that's uh, yeah. If you took the absolute value of l, that vector, is, no. is that is that an observable quantity, and would you get it? Is it is? So let's uh, let's uh, all right. So let me tell you what's true. Okay. In 
instead of the absolute value, let's take the sums of the squares of the components and see what we can find out about that. I'm going to try to do it without my notes. Uh, yeah, let's take L squared. You might think that L squared is just n max squared. That would, that would make sense, right? You, you, you take the spin and you point it directly upward. The problem with that is that you can't know the z component and the x and y component simultaneously. So if you know the, the z component is vertically upward at n max, there's bound to be some uncertainty in the x and y component. All right? So that uncertainty in the x and y component will tell you that Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared will not quite be m max squared. Right. It'll have a little extra. So let's compute it. That's a, that's a fun thing to compute. Let's see, I, I was going to go without my notes, but there's always one thing which I have to go through to remember. Yeah, okay. Let's take L squared. L squared means Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared. And of course, the name of the game here is to rewrite things in terms of L plus, L minus, and LZ. L plus, L minus, and LZ are... Uh, so what is L squared? Let's start with L minus. All right. So what would we do to get L squared? We would add LZ squared. And that would be it, right? Classically. <coughs> but not quite true quantum mechanically because there's this extra commutator term. The extra commutator term, uh, L plus L minus, is not equal exactly to Lx squared plus Ly squared. It's in fact Lx squared plus Ly squared plus a term coming from the commutator of Lx with, or with, of Lx with Ly. So let me write down what that extra term is. What's the commutator of Lx with Ly? Um, it's got to do with LZ. Mm -hmm. There's an I over here, but the commutator also has an I in it, so the I's are going to cancel. And if you work it out, you find out that it's just plus L, uh, that, uh, L, uh, let's see, that, that L plus L minus is LX squared plus LY squared, uh, I think it's minus LZ. And that means that L squared has another term in it, which is just plus LZ. It's definitely plus over here. I think it's minus, uh, yeah. Just an extra term coming from that commutator. The little mistake we made when we said that L, that L plus times L minus is LX squared plus LY squared. Okay, we made a little mistake, and the little mistake is proportional to LZ. And here's how it comes in. Okay, now let's take L squared and operate on a state which is M max, which has the maximum eigenvalue of M. What do we get? L squared on that is equal to L minus L plus on M max plus what do I get when, when LZ hits M max? Uh, so M, 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 uh, M max. So here we get plus M max squared plus M max times the ket vector M max. Well, what about this? I, I went through all this effort, but I'm still left with something I don't know what it is. Zero. Zero. But I do know what it is because L plus, when it hits M max, has nowhere to go. All right, we've reached the ceiling, this is zero. So what have we found out? We found out that the eigenvalue of L squared for this state up here is just M max squared plus M max. In other words, M max times m max plus 1. m max times m max plus 1. It's not m max squared. m max times m max squared plus 1. Classically, it would just be m max squared, the maximum value. 
But because of the fluctuation, because of the uncertainty principle, which says that things which don't commute can't simultaneously be specified, there's got to be some fluctuation in them, and that fluctuation manifests itself by a little shift here. Okay, so let's take the case, for example, of a spin zero particle. What is L squared for a spin zero particle? Wow, that's not interesting. N max is zero in that case. This is zero. Good. What about a spin one particle? Turns out to be two. What about a spin a half particle? A half times three halves is three quarters. So for a spin, what about a spin thousand particle? Well, yeah, that's right. If, if n max is big enough, this little shift is not important. You know, if we take a spin of 100 billion billion billion, we're just going to get the square of it plus a tiny uh, irrelevant uh, little uh, change. So classically, it's a very good approximation that L squared is just a max. Now, if you worked out, you can do this, you can work out L squared on each one of these states and you'll get the same value. All of these states have the same value of L squared. That is the quantum mechanical analog of the statement that when you rotate the particle to change its z component of uh, angular momentum, it just it doesn't change the square of it. It doesn't change the magnitude of it. So that's a little exercise. You could uh, work out using, again, just the commutation relations of the angular momentum. Can you know the square of the angular momentum and the z component simultaneously? Yes. You can, and you can check that by computing the commutator of L squared with the individual components of the angular momentum. What you'll find is that the commutator of L squared with any one of the components is equal to zero. So that means, although you cannot know two components of the angular momentum simultaneously, you can know a component and the total square value of the angular momentum. <coughs> Every electron has a squared spin, the spin angular momentum, equal to 3 quarters. Every electron has the same value, and it doesn't matter which play way the electron is oriented. Did you say for the, the spin 1, the L squared is going to be 0 for all? Or just for the 0 case? I didn't understand that. No, L squared is 0 for the spin 0 case. Okay. Spin 0 only has one state. It's got angular momentum 0. For n equals 1, the, the L, L squared is 2, I think. Two. Okay. 1 times 1 plus 1. Right, right. right. And for spin 3, what is it? Uh, L times L plus 1 is 3 times 4. 12? You said that, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to see how the, it's always the same no matter which level you oh, take. Oh, that you have to work out. So how do you work it out? You, you work it out by saying, let me take M max, and now hit it with L minus. This gives me M max, this gives me the next one down. M max minus 1. And then hit it with L squared and use the tricks, use the algebraic tri tricks, and show that when you hit it with L squared, it just gives you uh, the same eigenvalue. The same as? Uh, that, all right, so the algebraic statement is that L squared on the thing in the red box, again, yeah, draw a red box around the vector that you're interested in, that this is equal this is, uh, this is equal to m max times m max plus 1, m max, uh, not m max, m max, m max, m max plus 1 times the thing in the red box.
All right, that L squared has exactly the same eigenvalue as it had for the max itself. Yeah, and you get that from the formula over there? You get that from manipulating the operators. Okay. You get that from manipulating the operators. You use, yeah, you use this formula here and manipulate it and fiddle around with it and um, yeah, it takes it takes a few minutes of work. Okay. It also follows from the fact that L squared commutes with L plus and L minus. It commutes with all the components of the angular momentum, so it computes, commutes with L plus and L minus, and it just follows from that. So, yeah, they all have the same squared angular momentum. All right, let's talk about uh, rotational invariance, not in detail. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. That'll be for another time. Uh, but we seem to have nothing but some discrete states of angular momentum along the z-axis. What about rotating that? Uh, if we rotated it, wouldn't we get angular momenta which had fractional value along the z-axis and maybe some components in the other direction? So for that, let's, let's concentrate for simplicity on the spin-a-half case. On the spin-a-half case, the spin-a-half particle, the spin angular momentum, has only two states. It's not true that an electron has only two states. Uh, it has an orbital motion and it has a spin angular momentum. Let's just concentrate on the spin and nothing else. Then concentrating on the spin, there's only two possibilities, up and down, half spin up, half spin down. Let's call them, I don't like using red for equations, let's call them up, plus, and down, minus. These are the two basis states for the spin angular momentum along the z-axis. But there are certainly many more states that I can write down. These are not the only states I can write. In fact, the general quantum state of a system with two states like this is to add them with complex numbers. Alpha and beta are complex numbers. What is the probability in such a state that the spin is up? Alpha squared. Alpha star alpha. Okay. Probability for up equals alpha star alpha. And the probability for down is equal to beta star beta. If we add them together, total probability has to be 1. And so one of the rules is alpha star alpha plus beta star beta equals 1. One other fact that if I were to make a phase rotation of each of these complex numbers, in other words, if I was to multiply alpha and beta by the same phase, e to the i theta, e to the i theta, that does not change the physical character of the state. And the reason is because all interesting quantities are things times complex conjugates. These will cancel out of any interesting physical quantity. And so there's one, well, the way to say it is there's one degree of freedom, namely the overall phase of alpha and beta, which is unphysical and which doesn't matter, which is irrelevant. Okay, let's count now the number of variables, the number of parameters that it takes to specify a quantum state of, an, of the spin of an electron. Alpha is a complex number. It has two real components. Beta is a complex number. It has two real components. So, so far we have four real components. But we have a constraint. Alpha star alpha plus beta star beta is 1, so that means only three real components, the number of independent uh, variables. On the other hand, one combination, the overall phase, is unphysical. Let's just ignore, let's, uh, eliminate it some one way or another. That brings us down to only two independent variables specifying a quantum state. 
Two independent variables specify the quantum state. Now, how many independent variables, if an electron were a little arrow of a given length, its angular momentum vector, how many variables does it take to specify the orientation of that angular momentum? Two. Two. The polar and azimuthal angle uh, of the sphere describing the end of the vector. They're the same thing. You rotate around the spin of the um, electron by varying alpha and beta, but no matter which axis you measure the angular momentum, it's always an integer. That is to say, the actual measured value is an integer. What about the average value? Can the average value be, no, I'm sorry, it's not an integer, it's a half integer. Plus a half or minus a half. Can you get anything but plus a half or minus a half for the average value? The average value. So what does the average value mean? What does the average value mean? The average value means you take repeated identical experiments, where in each experiment the electron was prepared with exactly the same quantum state, and in each case you measure the z component of the mm -hmm. angular momentum. Sometimes you get plus a half, sometimes you get minus a half. The average is to take the ensemble of all of them together, add up the z component of angular momentum, and divide by the number of uh, experiments that you did. Just the average angular momentum. That can certainly be anything. That does not have to be. Uh, for example, if we just chose alpha equals 1 and beta equals 1, what's the average z component of the angular momentum? Zero. Zero. In fact, this happens to correspond to the spin of the electron along the x-axis instead of along the z-axis. Up along the x-axis. It's been rotated by 90 degrees. Nevertheless, when you, multi when you measure it along the z-axis, you'll get plus or minus 1. But the average is 0. So it's the averages which behave like the classical variables. If you take a spin up and you rotate it by 90 degrees, the average spin along that vertical axis will be zero. The averages which behave classically. Uh, this is a spin along the x-axis. What's a spin along the y-axis? Anybody remember? No, 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 no. Okay, good, good. It's a good guess, but it's the wrong guess. This is a spin. Uh, this is the z-axis. Here's the z-axis. Here's the x-axis. This corresponds to a spin which is pointing along the x-axis in this direction with a plus sign. With a minus sign, it corresponds to a spin pointing still along the x-axis but in the opposite direction. We still haven't found the one which points along the y-axis. I and minus I correspond to orientation along the y-axis. No. And with other values of alpha and beta, you can make spins which are pointing along an arbitrary axis. Pointing along an arbitrary axis means if you measure the component along that axis, you'll always get the same answer. So, uh, That's pretty much spin in a nutshell, and as I said, it is the, <coughs> the electric charge, the mass, the spin of a particle are its most important properties. Now there's a correlation which I should not only mention, but emphasize very strongly, because it's one of the prime facts of elementary particle physics. It's actually a theorem of relativistic quantum mechanics, but we're not going to try to prove it. And the theorem is a correlation between the values of the spin of the particle and whether it's a fermion or a boson. Remember, fermions are the ones that you can't put two of them in the same state. Bosons, they have a Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, bosons are the ones that you can put into the same state. They behave like photons and they make classical waves. Half spin particles are always fermions. Without exception, by half spin I now mean 
one half, three halves, five halves, anything which is um, a, a um, measure in half units, uh, where the spectrum is half units instead of uh, units. Those are all fermions. And all particles which have integer spectrum like this are bosons. A spin zero particle is always a boson without exception. A spin uh, two particle is always a boson. And what happens if you take two half spin particles? Take two half spin particles, uh, which one of which happens to have one value of m and the other has another value of m each one having a half unit. It could be three halves and minus seven halves or whatever. What happens if you add up their angular momentum? You get an integer, not a half integer. Right? That tells you that objects which are made up out of an even number of fermions are always bosons. Any object made of an even number of fermions will have an integer spin. Because it has an integer spin, it's a boson. Uh, what happens if you take a boson and add it to a fermion? Oh, well, let me give an example. An example would be a hydrogen atom. A proton is a half spin particle, just like an electron. Half, not three halves, not five halves, a half. Proton has a half spin just like the electron. You take a hydrogen atom, it's a fermion. You take an electron and you put it in orbit and you create a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom becomes a boson. Now this is not the, hy this is not the hydrogen isotope, this is the hydrogen atom with just a single proton in its nucleus. Um, a deuteron is a proton bound to a neutron. Neutron also is a half-spin particle. A deuteron is a boson, half-spin and another half-spin. What about deuterium? Deuterium is a proton and a neutron that forms a nucleus with an electron in orbit around it. Okay, what's the, what are the quantum, what are the, uh, the possible values of the z component of spin going to be? You take, it's, it's basically three half integers added up. Three half integers will always be a half integer again. Okay? So, a boson together with a fermion is a fermion, a boson together with a boson is a boson, and a fermion together with a fermion is a boson. Okay. So deuterium is a fermion, uh, hydrogen with only one proton, is, what did I say, deuterium is a, yeah, a hydrogen <coughs> is a boson. Okay. I think I got it right. Incidentally, particles and antiparticles always have the same spin, same mass, opposite charge. Uh, what about uh, positronium? Positronium is a, a positron in orbit around that, well, uh, electron and a positron orbiting each other. What would that be? Bosons. Bosons. Bosons have a property of being able to go through things? Or, I, I heard yeah. that. Yeah. Bosons have the property of what? Uh, be in the same state. I, I heard like. Superconductivity is like two pairs of electrons together, and they act like a boson. Therefore, that it's sort of transparent or something like that. Well, okay. Before you can understand the superconductor, you have to understand the superfluid. A superfluid, for example, uh, helium forms a superfluid. Let's talk about helium. What, the, what is helium a boson or a fermion? Ordinary no. helium. Okay. Why is that? It's got two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Two protons and two neutrons makes a helium nucleus, an alpha particle, and two electrons. So it's a boson. Uh, so whatever bosons are, helium is a good example of them. Helium atoms can all go into the same state. And it's when basically a super, can, a super fluid of helium atoms it's almost like a classical wave that you make by piling them up all in the same state. That's not quite right, but it's close enough for us. Um, they all move together uh, in the same state. Now, an electron in metal is a fermion. Okay, you can't put two electrons into the same state. But how about pairs of electrons? Here's a, here's a paradox. Okay, here's a paradox. 
uh, which we talked about last night, but uh, we'll talk about it again tonight. You take two fermions and you put them together and make a boson. Okay. How can it be that you could put two of those composites into the same state when you couldn't put the constituents into the same state? Does that make sense? So, does it or doesn't it? No. No? Okay, I'll tell you what does make sense. I'll tell you what, what exactly it means. Um, you know, let's do that next time. I think I'm, I'm running out I'm running of steam. Um, and remind me, remind me about this. This is so interesting that it's worth uh, uh, 10 minutes on. How two fermions, when they make a boson, how you can put the bosons into the same state, even though the fermions can't be put into the same state. Okay, so we should get back to that. And I'm reaching uh, that point in the evening where uh, I'll, I'll get confused if I try it. Yeah. Since uh, protons and neutrons are composite, why is it that they're half spin? Is it the spin? No, no, they're composites of odd numbers of fermions. <coughs> protons are three quarks. quarks. A quark is a half spin particle. Okay. So it's, it's going to be a fermion. Three fermions make a fermion. All right, just the last observation has to do with the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, it all comes, it was all discovered from staring at the uh, periodic table long enough. Um, Pauli said that you can't put more than one electron into the same orbital, orbital in an atom. No, he didn't say that. He said you can't put more than one electron into the same quantum state. He knew very well that you can put two and no more than two electrons in the same orbital uh, state in the atom. He knew that because he knew, uh, roughly speaking, that, uh, that if you take a hydrogen atom, you double the charge of the nucleus, and you put another electron in, the two electrons go into the same state, the same orbital state. Okay. So Pauli's exclusion principle did not apply to the orbital motion, it, it, it applies to the entire quantum state. The entire quantum state includes the spin state. You can put two electrons into the same orbital in an atom as long as their spins are in the opposite direction. You can't put two electrons with spin in the same direction, as long as the axis here. You can't put them in the same direction, but you can put them into spin states in the opposite direction. As long as they are different, as long as they are different, two electrons, and that's the property of the fermion, two of them can't be in the same quantum state, but quantum state includes everything about the particle. So that means in every orbital in an atom, you can put no more than two electrons, and when there are two electrons, they have to be in uh, what's called spin singlets, which mean their spins cancel. You can think of that like mesh gears. <laughs> right. If they're going in the same rotation, they go in opposite directions. Right. Yeah, if they're going in the same direction, you can strip the gears. Right. <laughs> Indeed. I know, I've done that in my car. An orbital anatomy is one of your sort of shots in. What's an orbital? Uh, orbital, I simply mean the state of an electron if you ignore the spin. Orbit, an or, uh, am I using orbital in a way that a chemist wouldn't use it? Who's a yeah. chemist? Yes. I am. Okay, uh, uh, I'm, what I mean by orbital motion is not what a chemist means by an orbital. What's an orbital again? That's some SPDF. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean a it's quantum state, state, a solution of the Schrodinger numbers. equation, a solution of the Schrodinger equation, ignoring spin. It, it creates the, the, the chart, the periodic chart that's yeah. up there. Yeah. And so that's how come you have uh, two electrons in the inner oh, you shell. Have two, you have two things. You have SPD and all that stuff has to do with orbital angular momentum. Yes. But then there's principal yeah. quantum number, which is called yeah. N. And when I speak about the orbital motion, I mean both N and uh, the orbital angular momentum. That's a chemist's notation to call orbital uh, SPD and all that stuff. <coughs> You know what S stands for? I don't know what S stands for. Spherical. Yeah, it does mean. It does mean spherical. But it actually means a quantum state of zero angular momentum. 
P means angular momentum one. This is the orbital motion of there. D is angular momentum two. F is angular momentum three. And I don't know what G comes after F. I don't remember. But uh, uh, right. that's the uh, that's the orbital angular momentum of the electron. But the other quantum number is the distance, basically the distance of the electron from the uh, from the proton, and that's the principal quantum number. So what I would call the orbital motion, meaning that the actual motion of the electron is a composite of the principal quantum number and the orbital quantum number. Call that, let's just call that a state of orbital motion. The state of orbiting uh, both principal and, uh, and you know, all right, so the rule is that Pauli devised was that no electron can have all of its quantum numbers the same. Okay, that's the Incidentally, the orbital, well, yeah, okay. So, so, so from what you're saying, can you deduce how many electrons can be in each shell in an atom? Yeah. How many can be, not how many are. Right. You can yeah. deduce the maximum number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not going to do that now. But, uh, see, that, I hadn't intended to do it at all. But, uh, see, you've got the principal quantum number and then the orbital quantum number and then the spin quantum. So let's take. Let's talk about orbitals in the sense that chemists use it. Orbital means S, P, D, and that, Okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, an S an S particle is spin zero. That means the orbital angular momentum is zero, and there's only one, or, one state of the orbital angular momentum. What about P? P is angular momentum one. We're talking about orbital angular momentum one. But the rules of angular momentum are the same for orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum. So if the orbital angular momentum is one, that means there's three possibilities. If the orbital angular momentum is two, that's a D wave or a D, by, a D state, there are five states. So when you say one, that, that actually means up and down. Everything, everything being specified. So there's two electrons. In all the, first the things one. which, all the things which can be simultaneously specified, specified. And then the, when there's three, then there's two in yeah. each of those three. Yeah. So you get six more electrons for a total of eight. Right. Exactly. Uh, I hadn't intended to talk about uh, atomic physics today, but uh, we can. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, Really interesting. And uh, some features of atomic physics show up again when you're thinking about quarks orbiting uh, each other and so forth. A little different. Okay. Um, any questions? And if not, uh, I have a date tonight, uh, Friday night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a date with my pillow. <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.